So eosinophilic asthma, about 40 to 60% of asthma is eosinophilic. Remember what I mentioned? T2 inflammation being about 60%. So there's an alignment. Eosinophilic asthma, as uh, more EOs are higher, people tend to have more hospitalizations and ER visits. IL-5 is essential for the happiness of an eosinophil. If you remove IL-5, eosinophils are not happy and they die. So that is a target. So there are ways to target IL-5. There's a circulating IL-5 and the antibodies that attack soluble IL-5 in the body is mepolizumab, brezolizumab. They bind the ligand. Once bound, it prevents it from activating the receptor that lives on the eosinophil and the basophil, by the way. Another approach, different mechanism of action, is to have the antibody bind directly to the IL-5 receptor on the cell. Now, that antibody, benrolizumab, has a neat tail that is fucosylated, afucosylated, which allows natural killer cells to come in and kill the eosinophil. It doesn't spew its contents. It just simply implodes and dies a quiet death. So the whole point here is there's different, me different mechanisms of action. Whether they impugn different efficacy, we don't know as of yet. Now, one of the first studies ever using a monoclonal antibody in humans was done by Leckie and colleagues, and this is going back to the beginning of time, Lancet 2000. And what they did is they gave mepolizumab to patients prior to an allergen challenge, three allergen challenges. Placebo, notice what happens to the bloody eosinophil count. You give an allergen challenge, EOs go up. Of course they do because they're sensitive and the EO is an important cell in modulating atopic or allergen-induced bronchospasm. But in those patients treated, those patients treated with mepolizumab, look at that. The EOs that started high were nearly obliterated. They didn't go all the way down to nil, but you can see there's no more peaks with allergens. So this was one of the first studies ever to target a cell and remove the leak phase response of asthma with an anti-IL-5. Now, the Leckie study that then moved on into clinical practice failed in its primary outcomes, failed in improving exacerbations. And this is a good example of a good drug for a wrong patient because they took all comers. They didn't just look at severe asthma. They didn't just look at exacerbators. So when they took it to all comers, there was no demonstrable difference in functional outcomes. And that really gave pause, cause to pause as to whether this is an important drug. When redefined in the right patient at the right time, mepolizumab was really quite effective. And that's shown here. Uh, if we look at uh, Param's study, looking at mepo, mepolizumab, this is a sub-Q, 100 uh, milligram dosing of an anti-IL-5 currently available. In this study, they looked at severe uh, prednisone-dependent eosinophilic asthma. Notice patients without exacerbations. So a lower score is worse, all right? And what you can see, this is baseball or football, not golf. So what you see, placebo, these patients had lots of exacerbations, but with mepolizumab, you had improvement in the exacerbations. That led to other studies with mepolizumab and looking at exacerbations of refractory eosinophilic asthma. Now looking at cumulative exacerbations, placebo, lots of exacerbations. Look at mepo. Mepo now in patients with exacerbation history and a strong component of reversible disease, you can see that it markedly diminished exacerbations. But these early studies were curious because there was no change actually in the early studies in some of the other markers that we would have thought important, like the FEV1, or even, even at this point, the uh, uh, methacholine challenge as determined by the PC20. So we still didn't quite get the right group of patients that we focus on therapy.
On came Ian Prevard's study published in The Lancet, um, and this was a dose ranging study using three doses and using exacerbations as a readout. Now you're seeing a definite drop in exacerbations. So they found the signal, getting it to the right patient at the right time, and what's curious is all three doses were equally effective. So then two studies were done, uh, the Ortega study published in the New England Journal in 2014, followed by Elizabeth Bell's uh, glucocorticoid sparing, uh, sparing study. And you can see again now IV to the sub Q. This is the approved dose that you all are using right now. You can see whether it was IV or sub Q equally effective in decreasing exacerbations. And when there was a refinement in who you gave the drug to, that is, people with large reversibility components in their FEV1, now you saw improvement in the FEV1. Further, those patients who are on baseline uh, oral steroids, you could drop the dose of oral corticosteroids nearly 50% when people were on mepolizumab, and as important, what you can see is dropping the oral dose still provided the patients with substantial improvement in exacerbations. So what I did here is take you through the history of big pharma trying to figure out the right drug for the right patient. We, in our practices, have to do the same thing. We have to find the patient where we can say across the table with 75% certainty, you're going to respond to that drug. So that's the mepolizumab drug discovery and clinical development. We have it in practice. We now are using it for about four years, sub-Q uh, monthly dose. Resolizumab, another anti-IL-5 antibody that targets soluble, soluble IL-5, uh, is a IV formulation exclusively. And the uniqueness of resolizumab is it's BMI dosed. So in this case, you can tailor it to weight. It is an IV formulation. This is their clinical development, early phase two studies, looking at FEV1 improvement, 16 weeks um, with a duplicate study, then the paired registration studies that were exacerbation, and then the long-term safety study. So if you looked at the IV dosing of resolizumab in patients with high eosinophils, what was seen is as you step up the peripheral eosinophils in individuals, you find a marked improvement in the FEV1 with an improvement in quality of life measure as shown here is the ACQ7. So another important takeaway, EOs matter. If EOs are present, target using an anti-IL-5. But another lesson to be learned is the higher the eosinophils, the greater likelihood of a response. That has occurred in three different drugs from three different pharmaceutical companies, all demonstrating the higher the eosinophil, the more likely a response. So what's the break point? At 300 seems to be critical. 300 and greater, more likely to respond. If you're 700, gee whiz, this could be a life-changing event. Under 300, you may be in a toy coin toss. So we need to be careful in the under 300. Over 300 is a good metric. So if we look at the efficacy of resolizumab and poorly controlled eosinophilic asthma, and Nick had defined what poorly controlled was, you can see now <clears throat> the imp improvement in ACQ, markedly improved with resolizumab versus placebo. Of course, placebo had an effect, as does every clinical trial in asthma. There's a placebo uh, effect because people start taking the medicines they were prescribed. If you look at exacerbations in lung function, again, probability of having a, a clinical asthma exacerbation, placebo, and resolizumab. Dramatic improvement. Also, the IV formulation markedly improves the FEV1 
over placebo. And when you looked at the exacerbations and you looked at it whether required systemic steroids, placebo, resolizumab, in all cases diminished exacerbation rates. So now let's move to the antibody that attacks the IL-5 receptor. That's demonstrated here. And what it's being demonstrated is the IL-5 receptor is the target. When benralizumab binds to that through an alteration in the long chain of the uh, immunoglobulin, the natural killer cell binds to it and through performance and granzymes actually cause the implosion of an eosinophil. This approach, which is antibody-directed, cell-mediated cy uh, cytotoxicity, is unique for this drug in the asthma space. Other monoclonals have a very similar phenomenon in rheumatoid arthritis. But suffice it to say, takeaway, resolizumab, mepolizumab attacks the ligand that circulates, benralizumab circ attacks, attacks the receptor. If one looks at the annual exacerbation rates here at a Q4 or Q8, venralizumab, approved drug, you dose monthly for three months and then every eight weeks, which is a convenience, you can see a decrease in exacer exacerbations in patients with greater than 300 and some benefit even with under 300 but recognize I mentioned 300 was the cutoff. So if you were 250 or 299, you would have fell into this bucket. Now, this was a wonderful study done by Nair and colleagues looking at the oral corticosteroid dose. What they did is a very long run-in, being sure that the patient was steroid dependent, and then tapered their steroids. You could see in the first eight weeks, you could taper everyone's steroids almost by 50%. But when patients were on drug, either Benrev every four or eight hours, what you could see is they had a sustained drop of 75% of their oral corticosteroid dose, whereas placebo could not be sustained and had to pop back up because of refractoriness to their symptoms. Takeaway message here, this drug versus placebo can decrease oral steroids by 75%. It also extended the time to the first exacerbation, shown here, placebo, Venra, and you can see the time to first exacerbation was very much pushed out. Now, this is an interesting and provocative study. What Paramnar did here is say, okay, I'm going to look at people on mepolizumab, and then after a period of time, switch them to resolizumab. Now, this is not a comparative efficacy study, so please don't take that away here. This was published in the American Journal of Respiratory Critical Care Medicine. They got mepo. They looked at specific outcomes, switched over now to resolizumab, BMI dose to IV, and compared to placebo. And what he showed was interesting. If you're looking at sputum eosinophils, pre-mepolizumab, post-mepolizumab, there was a trend numerically in a decrease in the sputum eosinophils. If you look at pre-resolizumab, placebo, no difference. But with resolizumab, IV formulation, his central hypothesis was if I give this IV, I'm going to affect co different compartments than the circulating subcute given MEPO, and you can see here the eosinophils were annihilated. If we look at blood eosinophils, pre-MEPO, post-MEPO went down. Again, you saw a substantial decrease. Now, if you look at a variety of provocative markers, not only the presence of eosinophils, but the activity of the eosinophils, he made the point pre-post-MEPO, not a lot of change in uh, in the enzyme secreted by eosinophils, but it, after resolizumab, there was a dramatic drop, as well as seen with another marker, another marker of eosinophil activity. Now, in this study, it was not powered to compare exacerbation efficacy, and there was no difference in the FEV1. This was a provocative 
trial looking at biomarkers to determine differences. So what I want to leave you with is the IL-5 therapy today is essentially a human knockout of the eosinophil. We think of knockouts in mice, but we're saying these antibodies are so effective that they could obliterate the eosinophil in the body. To answer the question you need to know is uh, does the patient's asthma get better?